Welcome into One Bills Live. Pleased to be joined now by NFL Network analyst Daniel Jeremiah, who's going to chop up this Bills roster a little bit with us. Daniel, how are you doing? Good to have you. Enjoying your summer here? Oh, it's been nice. The weather's uh, been beautiful. I wish the Padres could hit a little bit, but other than that, it's been a nice <laughs> offseason. <laughs> yeah, life is tough in uh, San yeah. Diego. We that's know. A, yeah, that's a first world <laughs> problem there, Daniel. I just got to tell you. <laughs> um, let, let's begin. Let's begin with the newest stuff that's coming down. It's not official by the team, but the reports are out there by some of your colleagues <laughs> that Leonard Floyd is headed to Buffalo on a one-year deal. Um, I think his pass rush production is clearly proven in this league. Ever since he went to the L.A. Rams, he's really flourished. Um, he's a pretty good edge setter, though, too. I think, I think he's kind of underrated as, as a run defender. Just your thoughts on his complete game, Daniel. Well, one, I was shocked that he hung around the market as long as he did um, because you mentioned it. The production there against the pass has been excellent. That was kind of the one thing that was missing early in his career there in Chicago you know, moving around, doing a lot of different things with him, almost kind of a victim of his own versatility. Um, and then all of a sudden he goes to the Rams and they let him, you know, play on the edge. And we saw the pass rush tick up. He's always been good against the run. Even when he was off the ball, uh, he was good against the run. He's got such long arms. He can set the edge. Um, and I thought you saw him really develop a, a pass rush repertoire as he got more reps at it with the Rams. So, you know, there's a familiar there, f- familiarity there with Vaughn Miller. Um, and obviously I think he was, you know, very selective wanting to go to a, a place where he had a chance to, to win a Super Bowl. So, um, he's already got one of those, uh, one of those trophies. He's hunting for another one and Buffalo is a pretty darn good place to go. Yeah. And it's, and he, get, getting back together with Von Miller, uh, and the other guys that they have, they rotate through, how has it gone? And, you know, he had a little bit of a down season after post posting double digit sacks for two years prior, I the entire team had the down year last year. Yeah. What are your thoughts about him coming to this group of defensive linemen, leaving the LA Rams defensive linemen? How's that going to change things? The guys around him. Well, I, I think it's, you know, you look at the Super Bowl year that they had and when you had a healthy Aaron Donald out there, the difference that he makes. And, you know, to me, Steve, when you look at, look at the teams who were in the Super Bowl last year, you know, you guys saw Kansas city up close. You, you look at, at what the Philadelphia Eagles had, it is waves. You know, that is the way you do it. All the great teams you played on, you know, it's not one guy, two guys, you might have a couple, you know, individual stars, but it's really become a league where you need waves of these guys, 17 game schedule. It's grind. Um, and just be able to take that pressure off when, when you're the, the, the lone Ranger out there and you're getting doubled each and every week, 17 game season, you get in the playoffs. That's exhausting. You know, last year it was the talk when when Von Miller went there was okay. How do you preserve him so that he's he's healthy and fresh for the games that really matter at the end of the year? You know, unfortunately he got hurt, but I think it's the same philosophy here. It's a strength in numbers, um, and they've got they've got a good group there. Uh, if they can keep Von healthy, now you add him to the mix. I'm still a big believer in Greg Rousseau. I think you've seen him continue to take steps, and he's still incredibly young. Uh, Epinesa, you know, in, in baseball they always talk about like those the underlying numbers that would predict that there's more success on the horizon, you know, his get off numbers and a lot of the analytics stuff with him uh, says there's more in the tank with him as well. So I- I'm excited. I like this move a lot. At defensive tackle, you know, Brandon Bean had a slew of players, but all of them were on expiring contracts. You know, they were, he was going to have like five free agents in 2024. Um, and he said he wanted to try to avoid that if he could. Now he signed the youngest of the group, to a contract extension. I know there's been some, I don't want to say pushback, that's too strong a word. There's been some head scratching from some members of the Bills fan base because in their eyes, they haven't seen the week-to-week consistency from Ed Oliver that they think they should for a contract of this size. How do you kind of look at Ed's body of work here thus far, now heading into this second contract? I think he's a great example of the difference between disruption and production, you know, like to say, okay, maybe some of the production hasn't been what you'd hoped it would be. Uh, the disruption has been there. He plays on the other side of the line of scrimmage. Um, y- you see that when you pop on, on the video there. So maybe the stats don't necessarily get where you want them to get, but he's a disruptive player. And I think to, 
to Bean's point, you know, this is like one of the hardest things to find is interior players that can penetrate and can get on the other side of the line of scrimmage. Extremely rare. And with a game plan now, when you have an edge rusher and you can dedicate backs and tight ends and we can get away from them a little bit, we can game plan around them a little bit. I don't know that it's ever been uh, more important to have an interior player uh, that can really, really disrupt things, run and pass. So, you know, I think that's what, you know, what this signing is all about. It's some of it is about, you know, believing in and what's to come with him, buying on the future. He's still young. And the other thing it says to me is it just shows you how hard it is to find guys um, that you don't want to take that chance of going out and trying to find one. Now, certainly, you know, everybody, all these teams, particularly in the AFC, who have their quarterback who's taking snaps and, and kind of everything pivots off of that. One of the things that this Bills regime learned early on was it starts up front on both sides of the line. The Bills have spent a lot of capital and a lot of attention, paid a lot of attention to what happens between their offensive tackles, as well as signing a guy like Ed Oliver on defensive side of the ball as well. But they've got, you know, Osiris Torrance, top draft pick, uh, Connor McGovern they signed, David Edwards they brought in. Uh, they've already got, uh, you know, Ryan Bates, uh, Greg Mance, Mitch Morse, of course, um, Ike Butker, they've got a ton of interior offensive linemen. And the one thing that seems to be the overriding factor is they're all 330 plus. I mean, they got some big dudes yeah. down inside. Um, is that, you know, that's one thing that the Bills have always done, have learned early on here, and they have never forgotten. They spend more time on the interior of their defensive line and on the edge of their defensive line than a lot of teams do. Is that exclusive to them or what teams do you see do that and why and why do the bills spend so much time doing it and other teams sometimes don't well the teams that do are usually the good ones um i mean the way that you win and, and i'm not telling you guys anything you don't know there i mean you win with elite quarterback play you win with a dominant pass rush and you win with an offensive line i i've kind of change my philosophy a little bit on the offensive line in that, okay, man, you'd love to have a bunch of all pros up there, but it's like the anti tomato can offensive line. Like I just, it, you're as strong as your weakest link. I cannot have one guy out there that is going to be the target each and every week. And if I've got four all pros and one, you know, left guard, who's just awful, well, guess who they're going to fan out protection and attack the entire game. They're going to go after your weak guy. So to me, when you can have the depth that the bills have been able to amass and really just say, look, okay, we have we have some some really good players in this mix. And I think even on the defensive line, you say, okay, we have some really, really good players. Um, but to me, it's not, you know, maybe you can go around and cherry pick individual players around the league, say maybe you don't have one of those, or maybe you don't have one of these. But to me, they've taken the margins mm -hmm. and they've really been able to squeeze it and get down to the point where it's like, okay, there's not much drop off when we go from number one to number three, from number five to number seven. Um, and and a war of attrition in the NFL. That's everything because, I mean, you see it. I see it doing the charge games every week when you're preparing for the game and you look at the other team and you, this guy sticks out like a sore thumb. They're, they're going to target this guy. This is going to be Joey Bosa's going to have a feeding frenzy when they get him on this guy. The Bills have eliminated that. Yeah. We know that Sean McDermott's going to be calling the plays on the defensive side of the ball now, Daniel. Um, everyone we've asked, you know, in terms of his track record and history, as a defensive play caller in Philly and Carolina is when we ask people to give us a description, they say aggressive when describing, you know, Sean's nature uh, in calling plays defensively. This Floyd anticipated Floyd acquisition, uh, you know, coupled with Vaughn who's already on the roster and then a chess piece like a Taylor Rapp who may not start, but is too good to keep off the field. And we know Sean's done three safety packages in Carolina in his history how aggressive do these new pieces enable him to be? Well, it's a great question, Chris. To me, I think you look at it, aggressiveness in a couple of different ways. Number one is, okay, do you want to send extra bodies? Well, yeah, you can, you can do that. That's one form of aggressiveness. The other form of aggressiveness is say, look, we've got really, really talented players along this front. So we're going to eliminate the thinking. We're not going to ask you guys to sit and read. We're going to just attack with these guys. Let them get on an edge and go. Um, that's another way where you can play aggressive. And I think what Sean will do is I think he'll mix that up. He'll match that up depending on the opponent. Um, but I, you know, I think sometimes people hear aggressive and they think, oh gosh, you're going cover zero and this is all out. You know, you're sending 
six, seven guys every snap. I don't think that's what he'll do, but I think he'll pick his spots and having some of those versatile pieces in the back end will allow him to do so. But I think if you ask any defensive coordinator in the NFL, if they had their choice, if they could get home with their four uh, and really, really attack with their front, uh, that's the best way to play in the league right now. What do you see as the the trend that we Brownie and I were talking about? We watched out and watched a couple of practices, at least through stretch. And the Bills wide receiver core has gotten two things. One, much, much bigger, even with the mm-hmm. with the addition of Deontay Hardy, who's five six. The rest of their guys, the rest of their guys are significantly bigger and significantly younger than they were a year ago with the departure of John Brown, Cole Beasley. Uh, they have gotten much, much younger, not only w- with those slots, but also the slots that are vying to take over. Um, what are your thoughts about, you know, this kind of measurables for this wide receiver core and helping Josh Allen get maybe a more efficient crew on the field? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a couple couple things that come to mind there. Number one, obviously the strike zone gets bigger, um, which any quarterback's going to love. And, and I would say, you know, as many postseason games as this young group has played together now and, and Josh's career, getting a chance to see playoff football, I, I think the windows shrink. I was talking to a defensive coordinator about this a couple years ago, and he just said, you know, we were talking about evaluating guys on the other side of the ball. And he said, when you get in playoff football, the, uh, you know, the, the underrated aspect of a wide receiver is play strength just because it's going to be more contested. The windows are going to shrink. Can you get, can you get combat catches? Can you catch the ball and absorb contact and still make plays? Um, you're just not going to be able to shake free and get wide open uh, like you are in the course of a regular season. So I, I think to me, this is a team where everything you're building now is towards a championship. And so it's those little areas trying to see, okay, what's the difference here? Well, you know, maybe being a little bit more physical and that's also going to benefit the run game, you know, no block, no rock. There's a lot of teams that have that philosophy, get out there and be physical. And now you've got guys that can really play that way. On the defensive side of the ball, the Tremaine Edmonds void is going to be filled by somebody in-house. They did not sign, you know, a major free agent to come in and battle for that position or step into the starting role. And I thought it was interesting last week, linebackers coach Bobby Babbage Jr., basically said in an ideal world you have two matchup linebackers out there for our defense which to me screams an athletic guy that can cover um Mm -hmm. they certainly have those kinds of players in house dorian williams is one of them and terrell bernard is probably the next most athletic in terms of coverage ability um what do you have to protect against though when you have that kind of an athlete running around out there at your mike linebacker spot well, I mean, look, it's it's no mystery. If you can't cover, you can't play linebacker in this league anymore. So that's like where you start. If you can't do that, then it's just, you know, it's not going to work. So you have to start there. Then hopefully you, you as those guys play more, you can get a little bit of physicality out of them. They're just going to have to beat blocks with their quickness, slip blocks, play underneath blocks. Um, that's going to be the way that they're going to have to play. And Dorian Williams, like just, you know, that name coming up is someone who studied going into the draft. That was his specialty. Um, is beating guys to spots and, and playing that way. There's going to be times you're going to get caught and you're going to get wiped out a little bit. But to me, it, you start, I just want the guy to be able to cover first and foremost, and then we can work around everything else. Yeah, and when you talk about you know working around everything else, this is a defense that has been really solid. And this has been my take for a long time about the defense under Leslie Frazier. Very solid. Top five defense year in, year out. But lack the ability or the characteristic of making a play when it really mattered certainly we got a little of that early last season when von miller showed up a couple of sacks on opening weekend against the rams his old team but you know then he got injured later in the season and it was a team that was very difficult to move the ball on really good on third down but when it came time to make a real play get a turnover get an uh, get that sack force fumble sack strip fumble it just didn't seem to have the kind of playmakers to do that is there a a philosophy or a, you know, perhaps a defensive coordinator can make a difference in that regard. What are your thoughts on, on a defense being maybe perhaps lower ranked than in the top five, but more spectacular at the occasion in the timely moments? Yeah. And, and look, you're trying to get, you're trying to get extra possessions. Um, the game is so slanted towards the offense right now. So if you can, you know, get some turnovers, get in a couple extra possessions, that's the name of the game. And, 
I, I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of being able to play free, being able to play fast, and that aggressive kind of attacking mentality. Um, and that can come in, in a couple different ways. So, you know, I'm hoping that's that's the answer because I think they have the athletes, especially you throw Leonard Floyd into the mix now. They've got guys that can win one-on-one. Um, to me, I think it's about simplification. Let them get on an edge. Use your athleticism and absolutely go and, and live with it. Look, you, they they pop a draw on you here or there, and you give up a you know an explosive run. To me, you, you just you got to live with that because you've got to embolden these guys to play. You know, all gas, no brakes going forward, no no hesitation, less thinking, more attacking. Um, I think the way the offense is going to put up points for Buffalo, you can afford to have a, you know. You can afford to give up one here or there. I think you're better suited to just play aggressive, see if you can't steal the ball back. Last one for you, Daniel. And again, thanks for the time. I can't believe we got this far without talking about the top draft choice that you were over the moon about in uh, <laughs> NFL Network's draft coverage. I think you said something to the effect of, if the rest of the league is going to allow the Bills offense to get Dalton Kincaid, it's not even fair. Um, what can we truly anticipate? You know, we know that, in Buffalo, you really have to earn your time on the field as a rookie, even if you're a highly touted first-round draft choice. There are exceptions in the Bean McDermott era, but they are very few. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> I think in two years, you're talking about an 80-catch guy. What do you envision for him in year one, though? I think red zone. Um, I think he's going to be a weapon down there. I don't think he's going to have to catch that many balls to have an impact. I think he's somebody that can go out there and get you some some key third downs, some key red zone um, catches in production, and find his way into the end zone. Um, I think it's 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 going to help alleviate some of the pressure on Diggs um, and Knox because it's just another guy you're going to have to account for. So I think it just all fits together in the puzzle. The run after catch is going to be outstanding. Um, you know, it's a matter of just how many balls there are to go around that that will limit his production early on. Um, but I, I think I think the exact thing I said was if this if somehow the league allows Buffalo to get Dalton Kincaid, then it's going to get what it deserves. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what the line was. Yeah, that that that's where we are because to me he's just such a weapon. And you know, with tight ends, a lot of times you go, okay, we get the you know kind of the combat catch guy, the physical in a crowd catches, and then you get the undersized, you know, can separate, but man, you lose some of that physicality. He gives you both. Um, so I was a huge fan of his game from the first tape that I watched against USC. I was sold. Um, all he did was uncover and make plays. So, um, again, I'm, I'm as excited as you are about year two, but I wouldn't sleep on year one being pretty fun as well. Daniel, thanks so much for spending some time with us today. We'll catch up with you down the road. Appreciate you. All right. Appreciate you guys. Take care.